Hello everyone. Welcome back to our SF Masterworks reading group. Today we are going to be discussing Babel 17 by Samuel R. Delaney. <laughs> 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 we are uh, the, the SF Masterworks reading group reads one book from the SF Masterworks series that I believe it was Golang's published. Um, we are reading one book every month um, and that will take us approximately 15 years to finish. Don't do the math. We try not to. <laughs> so, but the next three books that we are going to be reading are A Lot of Light by Roger Zelazny, The Fifth Head of Cerberus by Jean Wolfe and No Flyby for that one, Chris, <laughs> and no. Gateway by Frederick Pohl. <laughs> so, um, over the course of February, March, and April. If you'd like to join us for any of these discussions, either here in the discussion group or on the forum, please consider checking out the page chewing forum where we do all our planning for this reading group. Uh, and with me, of course, I have the usual group of wonderful people we talk about these books with. Livia, would you like to start us off with introductions? Yes, thank you for inviting me. I'm Livia J. Elliott. I'm an author and also a podcaster. My podcast is called Books and None. And I do deep dives on the thematic work of different books. Chris. <laughs> yes, my name is Chris Mullen. Sometimes YouTuber, sometimes appear in other people's channels talking about things that I love. And um, yeah, that's about it. Jared, you're up. Um, Jared, I run the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel and um, also here on page chewing forums as well. And uh, Susanna. And I am Susan Imaginario. I am a writer and sometimes YouTuber at the end of the year. Nice. So what's the general verdict on Babel 17? I finished it like 15 minutes before we started recording. <laughs> <laughs> That's not enough time for you to, to actually think what you know about this, because I closed the book on this and kind of went... I'm not sure exactly what and what happened in that book at all. Uh, and even though I don't know it a few hours ago, I think I like it more every, every hour. Mm. <laughs> it's fast. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm going to be honest and just get it out of the way. Um, I hate it so much, uh, and I rarely actually say that about a book. Um, usually, you know. I get bored reading a book. I DNF'd it, by the way. I I, I couldn't. I couldn't. When mm. when it started with a with a gimmick, it's with a with the italics, and I I just I gave up. Um, it, but it really made me angry for so many reasons. And um, yeah. Yeah, we, should, just, we should talk about it, all the angry <laughs> reasons. Which so, which italics though would. Um, I am, well, I'm just trying I to figure the out. The inset and talics ones, is it uh, the ones where the, the page with the squares changes? at the end? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I, that, I, I actually yes. had the opposite reaction. I just loved it <laughs> and read it twice. So, once for my podcast, once for this. So, this, this, I don't know. That bit? Yeah. I don't know how to work my camera. There we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to see that in a different edition it was formatted the same, Jared, actually, because mm. I, I was wondering yeah. about that kind of stuff, yeah. Uh. I think the Kindle edition does it too, if I yeah. remember correctly, but yeah. But Livia loved it, yeah, so this I is did. it. We have the two opposite ends of the scale. This is yes. fantastic. So the three of us can just sit back and watch the two fight it out, right? <laughs> 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 well, at least I wasn't the only one I was thinking, I'm oh, just going to be the naysayer again, but yeah. Almost as bad as Cities in Flight. Even though I, I, I don't know because Cities in Flight bored me. This one enraged me. So I don't know. Hmm. Different reactions, at least. <laughs> What's worse? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's worse, being bored or being mad? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <To> be <explored. laughs> Josh, what do yeah, you think? Being bored. Uh, this, yeah, this was not my favorite <laughs> um, at all. I. Um, yeah, well, I mean, we'll get into that. I it, most of the, most of it was I didn't quite appreciate his uh, his um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, you know, science babble. Um, yeah, I didn't appreciate it that much. I didn't find it engaging, uh, and I'm not a big you know science babble guy, anyways. But um, you know, a lot of other science fiction stories, I can get through it knowing it's gonna engage me into the rest of the story 
Uh, but this one, I didn't feel that. I and I and I was sad about that because I thought he started with an interesting character um, hmm. with uh, Doctor. Uh, what was your name? Uh, Wong. Right, Wong. Wong. Yeah. Right. Right. Wong. Yeah. And I, I, and I was like, okay, this could be an interesting character, but then it didn't, it didn't, um, the connection, the connections didn't get me engaged in her story and it didn't get me engaged in the other s stories in there. I thought some of his, um, description was when it was there, it was kind of bloated and mm -hmm. didn't um it didn't serve to give me a good picture of what was going on it, and that's just that's just my opinion i i wish there was um there was some there was some ideas in the book which a lot of these books have that their big idea um and this one was about you know the the language that the uh the idea of an alien language stack and have this profound effect on a on a person and stuff like that and um but i couldn't get past a lot of a lot of the a lot of the uh the, the techno babble um that was uh it was just ironic because it's called babel 17 so it's, it's kind of ironic <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm, I'm curious to to see what livia pulled out of this um because I, I have a feeling there's probably some there, there is some thematic stuff in here. I know that, and I'm curious what uh, Olivia you, you pulled out of that. Oh, I'm I actually quite liked it, mostly because it made me think it had that idea, uh, that style of old sci-fi, big ideas, big themes. The book does go a lot into the theme. Sometimes just explaining language, like there is a chapter that starts just with the meaning of you. And, and it says, like, you is a noun and all of this, and very technical from the language side. But the, the words the end, I think the book tends to converge into the idea that the words I and you are actually synonyms and that we are all, we all should have the same respect for the you that we have for the I. And without having the knowledge of the language as he's seeing it, I think it will be very difficult to understand why Babel 17 as a language ends up affecting Butcher and Rydra and actually making them so empathetic with each other. I did have a what the fuck moment when I was reading and you get that part in which she starts thinking in Babel 17 mm -hmm. and you have, I counted it, those are three pages of a single sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have the three pages and you have the little squares at the side that are actually the English translation of what is happening in the middle. I thought that was genius, not only in the execution, it's as uh, um, do unicorns read that book of channel she mentioned that it was ergodic literature, that you have that placement and so on, and you play with that. I thought it was very well done because I'm a bilingual. And in many cases, I have realized that thinking in Spanish is not the same as thinking in English. I can be mm -hmm. wordier in one language than in the other. And the, some of the problems that Rydra felt when trying to express something in English in Babel 17 or vice versa, I had them between Spanish and English, you know, things that I don't have quite the right word in English or in Spanish because it goes both ways. So when I have... Um, it felt um, quite realistic how he achieved that um, problem that polyglots or people that know more than one language have. So I think that is also why I ended up liking it so much, you know, because I could relate to some degree to the problems with the languages. I, I, I thought the chapter with the you and I explanation was actually pretty cool. That was the part of the book I, I liked. Um, beautiful yeah when he was when yeah. she was exp when she was trying to explain you and i to the butcher um i thought that was that part was pretty cool and i thought there was actually i was like i was like oh, okay finally i'm getting in some good <laughs> character interaction and you know hopefully the story will jump off from there uh but then it just that like the next chapter or whatever it was it just seemed to 
jump ahead in plot yeah and 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 kind of just lose that what he what what he gained for me in the storytelling department he lost in going further into um like into this this um uh, this plot which was basically just them um figuring it out this 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 mystery basically of, of the language and uh it, it lost me after that like i was like oh good mm -hmm. chapter good chapter and then and then and then i it, it kind of fell off for me after that yeah it's um something that i wasn't really into in this book is at the end um this may be a bit of a spoiler for anyone watching but it's all spoilers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they end up comparing Babel 17 to some old programming languages like Fortran and so on, mm -hmm. and the whole thing of a paradox. And I, my engineering brain was like, just nope, nope, nope. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. Um, that is something that I actually wanted to ask Marsha what you thought about. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think I was expecting the conclusion to be that this is some higher order language. And the conclusion was actually, here's a language. It, it's actually like this language that we use to make dumb machines to do the things we want. So it's an instruction language, but it somehow has more meaning. Like, yeah. What is it? Is it because of the zeros and? Uh, yeah, I, I I didn't see that reason. I didn't, I, I, I didn't agree with it necessarily but i didn't take that meaning from it i took it that the language was supposed to change how you think and process and actually mm -hmm. because of the constructs of the language it's almost like the language was a virus insofar as you trying to learn it and understand it changed the way that you thought enough that you things that you would normally care about and think about because you're thinking in a different language and form you would mm. no longer be thinking and learning about and you sort of got wrapped yeah. up in yourself then um rather than it necessarily being i, I think they only use the example of fortran etc to use the example like there's another language that doesn't use you and, you and I as pronouns. The, who is doing the action doesn't matter in a lot of things. And it was to create an allegory to that rather than actually kind of say these yeah. this languages like that. And that's the way that I that I took that from. So it bothered me less, I think, oh, in that regard. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um yeah, I think the bits about um reprogramming their brain by fixing the language that that yeah I they built a patch <laughs> <laughs> to fix whatever was broken but yeah i i think that i found iffy but i like what you just said chris that that makes a lot of sense it's it's only in the yeah analogy to the lack of the concepts of you and i just do this do that which, yeah um yeah that, that makes a lot of sense that part actually it made me think of um, another book Fahrenheit 451 and the idea of how what you think of can actually change uh, yeah, how you behave. This book in particular is uh, based on the strong sapir worth hypothesis, which is actually demonstrated not to be true. So that is why it makes so much emphasis on the uh, programming side of it. But something to think of, reflect perhaps, is the fact that we think that I and you are words that are so common and they are so intrinsic to our language. What could happen if you take a person that doesn't know any other language and you teach them Babel 17 with all those two words? How will that affect their worldview? I think it's quite a, a big question, you know, like mm -hmm. these old sci-fi books. But it could also, it should have an effect. Like Chris said, it should reprogram some somebody to think in a completely different way if you have no way of thinking of yourself and of oneself and the others, so I and you, and how important they both are. Hmm. And, and I was a little confused at one point. Was it because of Babel 17 that he lost the IU yeah. ability? Or was it, or did it, or did he lose that before he got Babel, the Babel 17? Uh, no, I think he he lost it when uh, Butcher lost it when he was taught Babel seventeen. Okay, all right, that's when that's when he lost. It, and right? yeah, and I liked it how he resorted to different things like beating his chest, kind of like saying the I using body language. Yeah, 
and uh, how important body language is to uh, add more meaning to whatever you are saying, right? It's it's also you know another example of kind of to your point, Jared, of like he didn't care about a story in this. There really was no point to the story. He used story as a vehicle for telling you something. And then as soon as you yeah. kind of get to the point with, oh, I'm invested in the characters and the story that's going forward. And he says, I know, but I have another idea that I'm going to get to here. So we're going to park yeah. that. We're going to call that part four. <laughs> we're going to move to part five. And we're going to explore yeah. another idea here. And again, on the concept of having really short fiction if you know what i mean the, 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 these are really explorations of ideas rather mm -hmm. than story and, and like i i can yeah. sort of totally agree that that's phenomenally frustrating because uh this feels like a very jekyll and hyde book a lot of the way through it it starts off in one place and decides to do something different for the next part it decides to do something different in another way in the next part like there's a lot of dialogue in this and it's, i never knew who was speaking like it just kept you know passing back and forth between people that never named yeah. who was who at any stage, and I was like, I'm. Just, it obviously isn't important who's speaking. It's just kind of um, exposition to kind of get to a point or explain something that was going. But I remember getting, I remember reading, like reading three or four pages and going, I have no idea who has said what in any of this at any stage, um, which yeah. sort of created a bit of frustration for sure. Yeah, especially when she they they went into that. I don't know if it was a bar or if it was a. Uh... A lounge of some sort of underground place mm. to get her crew or whatever and uh half the time like i didn't know who was speaking in that place who was speaking to who and it was it was all in lingo and uh yeah. colloquialisms and it it wasn't you didn't get a good um uh like a, a good setup for that in order to understand that setting and so you the setting was confusing the lingo was confusing and you know you could probably sit there and go back and dissect it one word by one word and go okay now i know who's speaking and, I, and now i know why they're speaking that way yeah. but um there was many times where the only reason i knew um what's his name was speaking uh the uh the one who couldn't say peas. Brass. Brass? Brass. Brass. The yes, brass. The only reason I knew he was speaking was because there was a peas missing. And that was it. And <laughs> I was like, oh, a good thing that that pea wasn't there because otherwise I would have got confused on who that was, you know? And so yeah. I was, uh, that, that, so that throws you off when, you, when you're trying to read this thing. And, Ultimately, it was like, well, it wasn't really that important to know who was speaking because he was just spitting out the ideas on the page, mm -hmm. and he, and he and it really uh, it it didn't matter, and that that not mattering to the plot or to the to the yeah. idea or the language doesn't make an enjoyable read for me personally. Yeah, I had the same feeling than you when I read it for the first time. I generally have a lot of trouble following dialogue that is not talked. It generally loses me. So when I read it the first time, I was just like the same. This is brass because he's missing the P and who is the rest one. <laughs> but when I read it the second time, I realized that uh, the customs officer, who is the only one that doesn't speak in lingo, he is as lost as a reader. And this being a book about language, on my second read, I interpreted this as perhaps something purposefully done so that you feel lost around all the lingo and you follow on with the customs officer who seems to be the only one who speaks in a more uh, traditional right. way. And when I tried to read, uh, like focusing on him, it actually made sense because the way it was written, it made me feel the same uh, feeling of being lost, right? I felt the same as yeah. he was feeling. And I thought that perhaps it could have been done that way, especially because uh, Delaney did have a literature uh, bachelor, I think. So he may may have been playing with language on a novel about language, you know? Yeah, I, I definitely think he was trying to play around with language. Uh, and, and I kind of wish that with the uh the customs officer, if he was a more prominent role in the book and we could have followed him throughout, then we would have had that vehicle to follow the whole story uh which is a common 
that's a common practice. You're like that's that's Frodo. You're following Frodo throughout the story, mm-hmm. and he's the blank slate that you're following and and kind of filling up. You know, you're you're getting the uh, you're learning about the world through, through all through him. And if if we could have learned about this world through that customs officer, then I think it would have been better throughout. If um, but unfortunately we were thrown stuff about this universe that it was um it was chaotically thrown at us and not presented in that manner of of uh, having a, that blank slate to yeah. follow through and learn about it with him i i definitely agree with the chaotic aspects of it I, and i think except for the forever war and i am legend all of the masterworks books have felt to me like that like they are well, cities in flight particularly so but you know the <laughs> the book that shall not be named <laughs> but, um we love naming it <laughs> <laughs> but um it it feels like they don't spend a lot of time explaining which is is a thing that you know authors who trust their readers do but it it doesn't feel like there's enough information to interpret and figure out like it it feels like they're they've cut it short because they have to rather than okay the reader will get this because i've said i've laid these other uh breadcrumbs that they can get to this point from it's like we change scenes introduce new concepts that well we can usually figure out from the context what they are but the reorientation process is not smooth, if that makes sense. Like I've, I've read books that expect you to get it or like that that don't handhold whatever, you know, the popular terminology is where things are explained. But and, and they don't feel jarring quite the same way these books have felt to me, the books that I've read and liked. So, yeah, it, it has been interesting. Like Things like I don't understand how much time has passed or um, I don't understand how he got to this point from where he was before. And like and, you know, the answer might be it's not important. <laughs> Just like focus on the ideas that I'm trying to explore here. And that's probably what it is, like you said, Chris. So the the focus is less on trying to tell a story well than uh, and more on hey here's a cool idea that i'm going to explore the heck out of which he did <laughs> which i i thought i i loved the idea itself that was being explored and the the i guess underlying philosophy that is also in that's potentially being explored like the idea that language is tied to our consciousness to such a deep extent that we can change who we are or how we behave or that we can do a lot more with fewer words um and i think it's uh nice that we read the story of your life recently some of us um which kind of plays with the same idea and arrival I, i'm sure everyone here has probably seen arrival right it, it kind of plays with the same idea of language doing so much more than what we maybe do with it which is really cool like it's it's not a thought that it's it's not something that I've thought about a whole lot but to go in that direction I think is a really cool idea and yeah I I think the idea itself is really really cool I was very happy with that aspect of the book for sure Mm -hmm. yeah the, the idea great uh, the execution, uh, no, it's uh, <clears throat> it, it is just playing with words. It's, it's not telling a story. It's just using. Uh, so maybe my issue was I couldn't help reading the book uh, from a writer's perspective. You know, it has every trick and wordplay and pun in the book that you, you can imagine. Um, it's so wrapped up in in creating an effect, which is great in small doses. I, I love when when the, the 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 writer is able to break the rules and create strange combinations of words and for, for effect. But this was just a very long affectation throughout. It was so wrapped up in in the, in, in the wordplay in the, uh, that kind of forgot to tell the story. Um, the main character. Oh my word! Um, just the name, right or wrong? It's like everything, everything is worth like 
And uh, well, she 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 was like the all gifted. It wasn't even the special one. Of the sto- she, she was she was like Pandora. She had all the gifts. She was a mathematician, a telepath, a, uh, Jesus, oh, just beautiful and and uh, yeah, the, it was just here's a cool idea and look what I can do with words and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. There was there was nothing else. Uh, and, it, and I was getting, it was very hard to read, yeah, to, to actually follow through any bit of action or dialogue, like you were saying. It was just, I found it very frustrating. It wasn't that I wasn't getting it. The idea is clear. It's just how it was uh, written. Uh, I, I thought it was very arrogant. Um, it's just uh, there, there were some... Um, analogies and and just entire sentences that I just like me as a non-native English speaker would not get away with it people will say oh you just can't write English but because you know he's a native English man he can't get away he's a genius uh yeah I was very very angry um but I know I'm probably a minority one thing I need to comment on that is that I will take this protagonist a female protagonist over almost any other female protagonist written by a man during the 50s, 60s. No, so, don't <laughs> at least it. Was like her. At least she is, uh, she isn't portrayed in a negative way. There are in many other books that the protagonists are sexualized or, you know, uh, the pretty girl shows to uh, be there. In this case, at least she has agency, she has... Uh, she feels like a person. Yeah, it's kind no, of she's, like a Mary Sue. She's, she's like the prototype of every woke character that ever exists in the last 10 years. It's like the super special one uh, with, a, with a traumatic past. And uh, everyone loves her just because, you know, she's so special. I mean, I, just, sorry, <laughs> I'm getting angry already. <laughs> I, I would rather have a flawed character being sexualized and at least, you know, feels real. Than, um, than this because it, it just kept adding up you know there's just more she, she, she was just better at something else and I just, it, it was so tiring it's just no I I sort, of see, I sort of see both points actually in a lot of ways I think at the start of the book and again this is part of the Jekyll and Hyde nature of it they spent a lot of time crafting why she was intelligent, etc. The scene with her in the bar, I think, was actually brilliant when she was reading again this non-verbal communication things or slight texts that somebody has about how language can be used yeah. uh, in a way. How she was able to read somebody's thoughts and as somebody, I mean, it, it basically said to me she was neuro- neurodivergent to start off with because that is a hallmark that I, I can describe like. I, I read people's auras and I know very slight changes in body position and stuff in much, and not the same way, but in like a, a similar kind of way. And I was like, I've never seen that put in the book, but it kind of give a an insight into her as a person because also she wasn't brash about it. She wasn't bold about it. She was gripping the edge of the tables, the, the cost that it cost her, if you know what I mean, in terms of, you know, it, it wasn't comfortable for her. Mm-hmm. You know, she didn't, she didn't appreciate that. And I love that part of the book. And I actually thought after the first like, Two, three chapters this is going to be something really special but the, uh, to Susanna's point they also that was pretty much the end of her character development at that stage that, yeah. that was that, yeah. that they, they pretty much a shoot at that stage uh for the part of of going to look for another idea another character and what was weird about this book is that it has so many characters that it gives off the stink or smell of of a character based story but literally is only concerned about one in the end which is the butcher and 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 even that yeah. character is like a, a non-event. He doesn't even know who he is. So it's almost like a joke playing on itself. With her, I think the the bird scene, you know, at the start when she gets mm-hmm. scared, it's only mentioned again at the end. And there is kind of like a tie back of okay, what happened there? It has a sense here. But uh yeah. It's like all of the characters, as most in these uh, sci-fi books, they are vehicles to tell the story, yeah. right? So they are not developed as characters as we would expect from the current standards. Yeah, yeah. I think 
for the first three chapters, I found it difficult to like her. And I think one, well, maybe not like her so much as see what everyone else saw in her, you know, uh, because the first three chapters, they had, uh, it, it was first three or four chapters. I think until we get to her perspective, um, I didn't like the way the other people were thinking about her or looking at her. There's uh, some of it bugged me. Like I think the the way General Forrester thought about her, I did not like at all. And then the customs officer, yeah, that was an interesting trip. But I I didn't get attached to the character at all. But I found her interesting to read about. And I think the what you um. Uh, I think you mentioned neurodivergence, Chris. And mm. initially, <laughs> her ability to do everything put me off. I'm like, oh, I don't need another Amalfi. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the it's interesting because you could, in theory, buy her ability to do all the things she does by the fact that she's a telepath, right? That and her analytical skills which you know yeah. she has mm -hmm. uh, really strong analytical skills which she's using to read micro expressions and stuff so maybe the fact that uh, she can because she is a telepath she also knows how to connect them to various body postures and stuff so when so like the two abilities interplay and do well uh, poetry she explained as uh, she's pulling picking thoughts off of other people's heads and completing it for them and again the math comes with analysis I suppose depend and apparently people here live to be 150 years old so maybe you can spend 15 years in school learning everything again so in theory there's an explanation <laughs> for mm -hmm, yeah. everything that she can do even though I can see from reading Amalfi how I hated that that one character did everything and you know there are jobs for those people but um <laughs> this one <laughs> this one felt slightly different like I I started off feeling unhappy about it but I, I was like yeah I, I I can understand why this works um yeah that 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 was what I was going to say about it but but no. it was yeah go ahead sorry Sorry, sorry. I just was going to point out, like, how many of these books actually use some sort of telepathy, you know? Mm. Like, all of them. And with the stars, my destination, they also had a telepath, right? So, mm. I don't know if it was something because of the time period in which these books were written, you know, late 50s, 60s. So. I, I think the Forever War also had some sort of, uh, I, I forget what it's called, but... Telepath? The not a telepath person, but someone who can read emotions or uh, they can, and like, not EMF. There, there's some short form for it, for the extra emissions, like psychic emissions, apparently. Like, there's a, there's an, uh, there's a short form for it. And that even Forever War, I think, had something like that. They had someone who would test on that index and they were more affected by the aliens than the others, if I remember correctly, some something like that. Uh, but yeah, that that's a pretty interesting topic that <laughs> that a lot of these books seem to feature telepathy in some form. Yeah, but it was the level of detail they went into on that because when she's explaining to the character afterwards exactly how she did it, and I think that was the bit that I just kind of went, "This is magnificent." That the person was able to do it themselves, and yet at the end, it was kind of that attitude that people have when they're around brilliant people or otherwise. But there's no way you did that. There's mm. no way you did that on the spot. Like they explained exactly what was happening and how it was done, and they was like, "Yeah, yeah, I can see that. It makes perfect sense." But no, uh, and they sort of left it alone, and it's kind of went, that, that, mm. "That's." Uh, that's such a brilliant way to write that scene and to have her explain it to the bartender at, at the end, you know, as, as being the vehicle to explain it to the reader. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. The, ah, sorry, I was going to say something as a follow-up to that. I forgot. But um, wait, did you mean the last scene, Chris, or did you mean the scene in the... Bar. Seen in the bar, seen in the bar when she's oh, explaining yeah. exactly how she spoke to the general at the time mm -hmm. and exactly how she knew yeah. what he was going to say. And, and it was in such a micro detail that I yeah, went, yeah. Uh, 
Samuel Delaney obviously lives that in some aspect because the way that he was able to do it, obviously, he's talking about an experience that he's had. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, because uh, even the reactions to it, etc., felt sort of personal in that in that regard. Mm. Oh yeah, I, I think I think I remember which scene. It's the one that starts out with "I will explain," but you won't understand. And like, yes, indeed. And, and he concludes that you're just making this up. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's almost like fine if you just want to lie. I'm not gonna listen. <laughs> like, it was exactly that that thing. And even though she went to great lengths to explain, and he kind of went, "Well, what if they said it like this?" Well, then I would say this, and then mm -hmm. well, that's exactly what happened. And yeah. he's like, "But no, that's not what happened." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did, did, is that echoing something that happened later in uh, in the book where? I think there was a similar sequence, but in Babel 17, where if this happened, I could just readjust to this. I I seem to recall something like that. Um, it wasn't with the butcher, but yeah. Anyway, like I, I, I really uh, liked how the language was used in this. I, I made a list of all... Sorry, did did anyone have anything to say in addition to that? I, I was starting a new topic. Jared? <laughs> uh well, I have a new topic too. So I just okay. had, I just have a few lines that I thought were pretty cool mm -hmm. that laid down some good ideas, um, and that was uh, like there are certain ideas which have words for them. If you don't know the words, you can't know the ideas, and if you don't have the idea, you can't you don't have the answer. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so that was like related to the explaining of the the you and I language, you know, and. and um, and then there was like the idea of until something is named, it doesn't exist. And uh, those are, you know, those are general big concepts of language that he was trying to, to throw in there and uh, just get people to think about. Um, and so, you know, the, and those are cool ideas that, you know, he was he was trying to explore and trying to play with in the book here um you know it would have been a lot cooler if it was a, if it was a cooler story to go with it but uh <laughs> it, it was uh you know it, so that there's a, there's there's stuff in here to get to get out of the book you know basically it's just... didn't hmm. didn't he use the example of french for the words for hot and cold for chaud and froid uh as basically saying yeah. they had no word for warm um, and because they had no word for warm, how do you conceptually think of of gradations of hot and cold between yeah uh, and other things? So I, I think he explained it really well. And actually, I will I will point people to Media Death Cult's review of this because I think it's an absolutely astonishing review of this book of what I think is quite a difficult book to review. He's the examples of how the Inuit people ha have fifty words for snow, and if they have fifty words for snow, their understanding of what yeah. snow is compared to a lay person must be on a whole other level to what other people think of it and so like language gives people this idea of, of power or gives people understanding and, and you would only think of the word if you understood what it is a bit slow and I think that's kind of the basis of what the whole book is in terms of what it's saying like different languages and the way you think in different languages force you to think very very differently and what if you use that as a weapon what if that was the weapon yeah. rather than chemical warfare or anything else and I think that as an idea is extraordinary whether the execution you get that out of the book is is another thing, but uh, but the the yeah. idea the the the, uh, the thought is is it was definitely you know worth exploring. Yeah, again, great great idea. I'm just going to give a couple examples. Uh, great idea, but uh, like he used some Portuguese words um, in here as well, and um, I, one of them in one situation. I, I'm not even sure if if he was aiming for the Portuguese or the Spanish. Uh, just because then the context changed to Spanish, but I kind of lost track there. The point is, there was no need to use that word. You know, there are perfectly good equivalent words in English, and I think they just use it for the sound of them. And again, another thing that pissed me off. Because <laughs> 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 everything, the, the idea is here, it's brilliant, and it just went about like the worst possible way you could. <laughs> Um, uh, I wanted to follow up on something that Chris said, that is, uh, what if it could be used as a weapon? And I had the same thought while I was reading this, and I instantly thought of Forwell's new speak and the A and B vocabulary that have that were actually created to restrict thought and change how people thought about something within the book and, of course, 
1994 has this whole political connotation, but it's, I will say, uh, um, the other side of the coin that Table 17 is presenting, using language in the negative way as well. And there was a sentence that, um, something that I wanted to read that follows up on what Jarrod said. Uh, I think it's page 133. If you have the right words, it saves time and makes things easier. And then that idea, I, you know, sometimes as a bilingual, I, I struggle with the right word, I end up having to describe it and going around it. And it felt so real. And it isn't that the doctor concept doesn't exist. It's just that, yeah, I can't explain it in a single word. When you have the single word for it, it it's faster and more concise. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually leads to that scene of the three pages with a single paragraph, because Babel explains so much in so little. Every word has so much meaning packed into it that she's able to just make that whole stream of thoughts, right? And I, I thought that quite interesting as well. I'm not sure what are your thoughts on that. Well, I, th I think I think from somebody that has done a little bit of study in, in literature and how the study of the English language is actually this idea of codes and keys uh, about how people yeah. interpret. Like the idea of the missing piece from Brass works on two levels. One, it helps you identify him as a character, but it also puts you in a very primitive form as the reader of trying to work out what he's going to say because like the letter P, there were a lot of words when the P wasn't there. I had to go back to the word and put the P in you understand the sentence if you know what i mean i had to literally use that yeah. code in order to read meaning for from that i and i also wondered how the hell did that sound when he wasn't saying it what does that sound like like that's that's really strange but but it gives you a very it gives you an idea of how you know you can spot the pattern and in a very primitive level you can then interpret the pattern to then derive sense of something even though it wasn't really given to you in the mm -hmm. sentence but I thought, again that was like very very clever in a lot of ways and, and like there's no doubt maybe the book is clever than than its execution for a lot of part but i think of all of the books that we've read when i was reading it i was like this is the one that i think i would derive the most enjoyment out of a reread from especially kind of knowing and understanding what the book was setting about doing a lot of those pages that i sort of skipped over and kind of went i don't even know what's going on here like i'm i'm just gonna keep on barreling through and see it seeing what comes out at the end i might get better meaning from them better enjoyment out of for, for the dinner line and like again thank god these books are only 190 pages long because if it had been 300 i might not have made it <laughs> <laughs> so chris you don't you don't speak your dialogue out loud when you're reading <laughs> so sometimes <laughs> they, it, actually <laughs> what I will say is actually is a, a technique that I would have if I'm struggling with dialogue or struggling with language is actually to read it out loud for myself. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. something that I do for a page or two to kind of get me in the flow and in the headspace. And yeah. sometimes verbalizing it does work. I do it uh, all the time. I, yeah. I have different voices for different characters and everything. Oh. <laughs> I, I generally do that when they, uh, you know, when they try to write a character that he speaks wrongly and just put up the sound. Like mm. I can't make up the sound, so I have to read them. And then I was like, oh, this is what <laughs> the sounds make. I have an interesting anecdote. Uh, while I was reading, there was one bit of dialogue uh, because I was huffing throughout the book. It wasn't even a FF sake. I was just, hmm, hmm. And uh, my husband asked, what, what's wrong? I said, well, listen to this. And I just went and, 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 and read the whole thing. And, um, and he went, oh, that, that sounds great. And he's uh, loving it. By the way, but apparently, <laughs> I I thought I was just speaking, you know, gobbly goo, and and he was like, oh, that, that that's interesting. Well, tell, tell me more. He's like, are you are you kidding me? So, so maybe it's uh, how the brain is wired. I don't know. But I thought it was interesting. Yeah. To mention. On, the, uh, on the subject of dialogues, I actually did not have difficulty following along. The and whatever difficulty I had was because of the indentation or like alignment of mm -hmm. like it's so one whole sentence like the same character would be speaking as in the paragraph but one whole sentence would go on the next line and because we're delineating by lines I'd get confused and think it's the other person but but as long as I was able to attribute an entire sentence to a character I didn't have that much difficulty following along with the dialogue so that I thought that was interesting that um 
that that seemed to be a common problem but whatever i had dialogue problems because of printing issues mm-hmm. so yeah i don't know anyway, that, i thought that was just curious but um i did have yeah i i made a list of all the interesting oh. hello <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I knew Susanna was angry, but there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought that was some dialogue. That, uh... <laughs> the... <laughs> of all the interesting tech that we came across in the stories, which I think also was used in the conclusion quite well, I'm, I I. I made a list of all of these, right? And then in the end, I was like, he's used almost every single one to explain Butcher. Uh, so the automatic James Bond. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> uh, Butch, Butcher, did I say Butcher or Butcher? B- Butcher is one. And then um, I guess, well, not the discorporate stuff. That that was cool. We have to talk about the discorporate mm-hmm. beings. And um the language, of course, he's ingrained with it. The plastic surgery that they are calling cosmetic surgery, which, by the way, the dragon in the show was really cool. And, uh, and then Butcher had that too. That's although he apparently gained some extra abilities to destroy and recreate these things as well, which, yeah, that, yeah, that was pushing the boundaries a little bit <laughs> on science and fantasy. But this was uh, interesting. The cosmetic surgery also was used. And then, uh, yeah, uh, there was one more. But anyway, that, I thought that was really, really cool <laughs> that he brought everything together. Because he said this in this far future world where there's so much new tech. Which is nice. I like I like when authors do that. I think I keep mentioning Philip K. Dick because he does this. Like, there's one theme that he's exploring, but the world has so many other interesting things to pick at if we wanted to. And this, but he brought it all together in the end. It's it's not just hey, I had all these cool ideas, I put them in the book, but he also brought it together. So I, I thought that was nice. In terms of the society and the space travel on this one, I thought it was very original and different. Like it may not appeal to everyone because it's, as you said, more sci fantasy than science fiction, at least in how the, the ships work and so on. But I have been reading a long series about uh, military, uh, military sci fi and uh, finding something different like this. I was like, oh, yes, something. Yeah. This is a. I don't know. I really like that idea of the these corporates with the nose and the smell as positions yeah. in the crew of the ship, and then the fact that the um, I thought there was some trials as well that were that they had to be bond together partners or something that would actually mm-hmm. uh, pilot man the ship, and I thought it was quite interesting, different as well. Yeah. Oh, I remember how he brought the discorporate people back in. Um, I think. Raidra says something to the effect that the only thing, um, I, I think the only, only the human mind can process something on this scale. And that has been established before because the discorporate beings are able to yeah. process so much data. So it's not, uh, yeah, so, so that makes sense too. It's not a random statement about the power of the human mind. We've established that earlier in the story with the eyes, ears, and nose, the sensory <laughs> parts of the mm-hmm. ship. So, yeah, I, th- I thought, yeah. Anyway. Something um, I, th- I thought it was quaint about the, the discorporates is that they need these special devices to listen to them and remember, mm-hmm. because otherwise don't remember. And Raidra resorts to translating instantly what she hears from them. And... Again, that hit home because in many cases I have been talking to people in English and somehow I translated it to Spanish in my mind. And then when I can, I want to uh, relay that conversation to somebody else. I think of the translation in Spanish. I can't think of the English. It has happened me, to me sometimes. And I, and I thought it was quite realistic. Like it, it was doable. What, what he was saying of how she handled the discorporate about translating it. I thought it was, yeah, it happens. <laughs> 
that's that's interesting i i didn't pick up on that at all <laughs> um, yeah. that's, that's yeah, very and... uh, that's very interesting yeah I think she uses uh, a weird language uh, called Basque. Uh, old, I think. Basque, yeah she, yeah, she uses Basque to translate it. So, so not a language everybody else is speaking, but the, the idea is the same. You trans, your mind ends up automatically translating what you are hearing from one language to another. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so it was uh, realistic in that sense. Yeah. Um, the other two aspects of the language that were interesting was I think there was this one isn't focused on too much but I think in the sequence where um, with those little text insets I think it was there that she has an episode of synesthesia is it where she, the she hears like she smells something or she tastes uh, a, some external entity because of the language she was thinking in so that that was interesting, I thought. And then the time, the slowing down time or metabolism mm. aspect of it. That what what do you think? Is that a possible with the language? Or just how did that read for all of you? So she explained actually the thinking and the smells exactly through the bird as well, the minor bird as well, didn't she say? She said about how the minor bird would speak about something and that that's how she was able to tell that there was an earthworm near. Uh, mm. and, and so that same idea was explained through that through that idea as well mm. uh, and how that was very dis distracting but the slowing down time again i think was very very interesting because i sort of think that's possible like i, I definitely do if you can kind of think about how you know when you think or or even like when you're working or engaged in a task how time passes much much more quickly you know mm. when you're engaged in a task so i, th I think a, a lot of that but again really interesting ideas to explore and kind of make you think about which was certainly enough to get me to turn the page a lot of time like it was it was enough even though there wasn't very much of a story and it didn't join together at yeah. all it, it 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 was enough to make me go okay keep on going like these chapters are quite short yeah. but quite short. and that's that's a good point there because that those ideas the the uh the the slowing down time thing and the and 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 the language thing that um Livia was just saying th those are awesome ideas that I wish would have ex been explained a little bit better that's yeah. all because i i feel like i missed out on getting that in a better way i feel like i missed out on that you know i wanted mm. I, wanted a, I wanted a better explanation of that yeah. stuff mm. yeah i think he left it quite implicit and i did feel mm. that perhaps uh somebody that doesn't speak multiple languages wouldn't get some of these things because that idea of the translation, it wasn't explained. I just completely 100% related to my own experience. And if it, it wasn't explained, right? I only uh, interpreted that way because of my experience, right? And I think I, I agree with you, Gerald. It should have been. Yeah, I, I, I got more out of it. It would be nice. I got more out of it from your explanation now than I did from reading the book. And that's... I, that's not how I want it my, to experience the yeah. book. You know, I if, want to get that out of the book. <laughs> if it's in a constellation uh, as, as a bilingual, I, I didn't get that. I mean, I get I got what, what he was trying to do, uh, but it felt almost insulting that that's how we think, that how that's how it works. And I, I totally relate to your need to have an explanation. You wanted the narrative, you wanted the story. And yes. Yeah. It, it wasn't there, but uh, and I, I'm, I'm very curious. I'm listening and, and, and I'm fascinated because completely different experiences. Um, yeah. Livia, I'm not criticizing. I'm, I, I, I'm always fascinated when, you know, things don't align. <laughs> so, That's the beauty of books, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's what makes this kind of whole masterworks reading group thing like just one of the highlights of the month for me because i, I know when i'm reading i'm never getting the full picture if that makes sense i'm always going to have an yeah. opportunity to get somebody else's point of view and either they fill in the gaps or reaffirm exactly that my original idea that i didn't like it or otherwise was for right if you know what i mean it, it, it there is yeah. other it's it's almost like having 
the opportunity to reread something a couple of times. If you know what I mean, you read it once yourself and then you get other people's perspectives and it's almost like you've reread the book yourself by them filling in the blanks. And it mm -hmm. does color your opinion of what the book is probably another six months down the line. When you think back in this book, you'll be like, <laughs> you'll remember it was sort of frustrating, but you'll also maybe have a greater understanding of what the book maybe was trying to do that maybe I didn't get when I was reading it, you know, at, at the time. Mm -hmm. And kind of go, oh, okay, yeah. And then sort of that falls through in the maybe what my reading experience was or wasn't, you know, kind of colors it in some way. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a really yeah. interesting idea. I just remember I had great fun throwing my copy of Cities of Flight into the, into the fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> But we all had the same experience with that book, you see, you know, that wasn't, that was, that was a communal, a few, communal throwing in the fire. <laughs> well, the, now, uh, again, a uh, horrible story uh, for me, because I'm, I'm such a bad person sometimes. Oh, because I gave, I hated this book, so I, I gave it two stars, you know, I did just, um, but then I was thinking, oh, well, but what because i had given two stars to city of lights uh, so i said well that's not fair so i went and changed the rating yeah, of right. city of lights to one i was gonna say that was exactly the right solution to that you know that was unfair on, on cities of flight to give it two stars terrible terrible but um, yeah <laughs> i i think i only had one two-star book last year and it was cities in flight i oh god <laughs> I, I i had to make it right because i even though I hated the book, um, it wasn't fair. So. Yeah. Good memory. Good memories. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I one other thing that I just sort of want to bring up is sort of think. Have you touched on it earlier on? Is this idea that the paradox has defeated the machine? I think this is very 1960s pre-computer kind of idea and, yeah. and why a lot of this links like I can't help but reading some of the short stories the Ted Chang short stories etc that we've read and just see a lot of kind of similar ideas kind of flow through that whether it's the linguistics of story of your life did they get that right that time yeah Portia? yes yeah. it's okay <laughs> then, then short to the uh, one that we read for the last episode which was about the idea that actually machines can only think in certain ways you know they don't think curiously they just think in in structure or efficiency you know and the, the humans will always perceive problems differently mm. than mm. machines ever will and a lot of those ideas coalesce in battle 17 especially at the end in terms of what we call the solution if you if you mm. want yeah uh, i just think it's really interesting how those things all tie together if yeah. i can make a, a comment on that so these programming languages have something that is called parading, which is basically the type of a programming. It changes kind of like a bit the scene, scene that, um, how you write. And uh, I thought that the, the paradigms that were being used at the time this book was written were very structured, right? Instruction like one after mm -hmm. the other. And nowadays we have a lot of different paradigms and you write in a very different way depending on the one that you have. And even if the idea of machine learning already existed by this time, that is on the 50s, it wasn't popular, you weren't coding like that, right? So the idea of a structured, and you follow the instructions and you get a loop within those instructions if you did it wrong, that's quite period accurate, I would say, <laughs> right? Nowadays, you would resort to other programming languages, you will resort to basically AI in which you don't write instructions, it's a complete black box right? And it you will have different problems. I thought that the way he was talking about programming languages was very specific of the time it was written and of how computers were programmed back then, right? Hmm. I... Sorry, go ahead, Jared. No, no, go, go. I was going to say, I, I didn't think of it then, but now listening to you and Chris talk about it, the, the whole paradoxes it mm -hmm. makes sense that that's how you would break a computer like thing because Back it's then. built on logical reasoning right so you uh, like you it's basically a sequence of applying a sequence of logic to uh the computer like even to program an ai model that's essentially what you have to do the outcome is something that we don't fully understand but to build that thing <laughs> you still use logic so to break it using paradoxes that that makes perfect sense so yeah especially, 
this is just writing a for loop and so that it can never kind of get, get to the bottom of it you know that's, yeah that's, that's, that's absolutely fine you know <laughs> and recursion into stack <laughs> yeah indeed you know so the idea is definitely sound to think but i think it does speak to the time the book was written and actually that I mean, it's still quite a bit ahead of its time in terms of actually having those ideas yeah. and the, the idea of computers, et cetera, as, as, a, as a vehicle for how the world works. Is, it's like, I, again, I, I can't help but have my mind blown sometimes by how prescient and uh, how predictable a lot of it was. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to make a crack about chat GPT earlier, but <laughs> <laughs> a machine that understood Babel 17, <laughs> bring on oh, chat yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's quite possible that ChatGPT is actually using Bubble 17 as its language, which is mm. probably why it just doesn't feel quite right, you know. Yeah, that's why we're all addicted to social media. You know? mm. Yeah, but <laughs> even, even, if it, <laughs> even if you think of it this way, well, you can change how you speak depending on the language that you are speaking, human right. side. And as a programmer, you also change how you quote unquote speak when you change a programming language that you are using to code, mm -hmm. right? It's not the same if you go from Fortran to Python, putting very extreme mm -hmm. examples. But kind of like even if they are different types of languages, they have an underlying common factor there, which is how you express ideas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I recently had that experience trying to go from Java to Rust. Oh my God, I had to relearn so many things. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that, I agree with what you mean. Yeah. See, that's a total another language to me. I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> two, two different programming languages. Yeah. <laughs> One that was easy for me, another completely new. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you a similar example. How do you get a, a two-year-old to do something? <laughs> you can't you can't reason and talk with a, that two-year-old in a certain way. You have to think of how you're going to approach and communicate with that child on a base level in a whole other way than you would for somebody else. It's, it's, again, it's a very similar idea um, as yeah. sort of explored in the book in some ways and how that yeah. might drive you mad, actually. Actually, this mm. totally works. <laughs> so did anyone else read the foreword? Yes. Before reading the book. Yes. Always. No. So, before reading the book, right? They always, I, they always spoil the book, which sometimes doesn't matter. But in this case, there was the whole thing about the traitor, which, in the foreword, is revealed to be Raidra Wong. So then, I failed to feel any sense of dread about mm. the traitor which I think was a big aspect of what could have made the story more interesting for me. Uh, you know, like when they were in the bar and, okay, that 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 scene was weird. When uh, the customs officer took the whole crew out and they're like, one of us might be working against you, but talk to us anyway. Okay, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but in the ship or in the mountain, Jab Jabal Tariq, they... The fact that there could be a traitor who uh, might sabotage anything, I feel like that could have made for a really dense or like thickening plot, perhaps. But I didn't feel any of it because I'm like, it's her and she's here. <laughs> we're seeing everything she's doing. Nothing going on there. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, how, how do you guys feel about that? I feel like it changed my reading experience quite a bit, knowing that ahead. I think I would have been quite frustrated because it doesn't even really like it would have become the point of the book, if you know what I mean, if it ever mm. ever had and you know what I mean, and it doesn't really resolve it in a satisfactory sense that the plot mm. line because that's not what the book's about. Mm. Uh, usually by the time I read the forward and get three chapters in, I've forgotten exactly what was in the forward. Okay. <laughs> maybe it, it just helps having, you know, getting older the brain cells don't work maybe quite as efficiently as they well, I, I, I blame for for creating such a um, high expectation for the book because he, he was praising the genius and the young man's book, uh, restless energy and uh, just all, all all the adjectives. And I was, was expecting something, you know, fantastic. And uh, yeah, no. <laughs> so I, I would change some of these adjectives. <laughs> oh. uh. I don't know. I, I didn't have a forward in my copy, oh. so um, I. Uh, but I don't know. I I didn't really 
feel because of the the the, uh, the plot and the rest of the book wasn't um, that gripping. Uh, mm. The trade of plot also wasn't that gripping for me mm. as I was reading it, and so I was just like, because it, it didn't really. It didn't grab me. It didn't grab me mm. the same way. The same way the characters didn't grab me that much, and, and and everything else that was um that was problematic for this book, as a for for myself, and uh, and so it it I don't know. I didn't. Uh, it wasn't uh, something that I was like on the edge of my seat. Who's the traitor? You know, and I was yeah. like, yeah. yeah. I was like, I'll either find out or I don't. And yeah, <laughs> kind of yeah. <laughs> left that. that. Yeah, I, I, I think I that makes sense. I, I don't think if I hadn't known, I doubt that I would have spent a lot of energy trying to figure figure it out because we don't know enough about any of the crew members to like make it a who done it thing. But um You know, if there was more yeah. tension built mm -hmm. up like if like if there was more tension built up towards it if they if if like the whole crew was blaming the butcher or something like that or yeah. it, but there was none of that there wasn't that kind of like there would that mystery yeah. wasn't built up enough to make the make it a focus of who is the traitor you know and yeah. so it it uh it was kind of a just a, a side thing along the way and <laughs> Yeah, it, they had a very cavalier attitude about it, right? They they brought the whole crew on. They didn't try to isolate anyone, which makes sense. Like, you know, innocent until proven guilty. But also, like, during that dinner scene with the cust uh, customs officer and was General Forrester there? I, oh, and the psychologist. Um, they're like, yeah, one of us might be working against her, but it's fine. Just tell us what you <laughs> ask yeah. your question. <laughs> Nothing we can do about that. It's a very uh, cavalier attitude towards towards doing it, to progressing yeah. the plot of the book. We need to get to the end of the book, as basically you would have said. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> only five pages. Can't can't get into the details. <laughs> and, I, and I also feel like we don't know enough about the invasion and the alliance to care one way or the other. Like, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it, it's fine if your ship gets eaten. <laughs> <laughs> In, in modern times, this definitely would have been setting up bubbly 18, 19, 20, 21, you know, as, as books to follow it, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Was there any other? Any other? Yeah. Any other insights here? No more rants. Um, no more rants. <laughs> so where does, it, where does it rank for everybody within the... Uh... Within the series, hmm. what so we got? How many? We, how many we got so far? Six, 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 six. Yeah. So this is yeah. This is the sixth. Yeah. 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 Five. Five. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly. At Three least there was no me. mansplaining, so I'll I'll give it that. But no need to be upset. The, the the wonders of having a female lead character, no man spinning. Excellent. That's all. <laughs> I haven't read all of the same so yeah. at the, from the start, but uh, so far nothing can top flowers for Algernon for me. Uh, mm -hmm. that one's Which was funny. released the same year. I was just actually looking. Uh, part of uh, yeah. the thing where Zan was going like, how does part of people love this? And I thought maybe. Maybe the books in 1966 were all were all shocking, but uh, that was not the case. The uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead and cold blood flowers for Algernon. Uh, Taipan came out that year. The Moon is a Horse Mistress by Heinlein as well. Like, so there were a lot of very good books out that year. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. I guess Flowers for Algernon is coming up next it year. Yeah. <laughs> next year, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm barely. <laughs> mm. But um, yeah, for me, I, I think I'm 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 gonna do buckets rather than ranks. Um, so mm. Forever War and Androids, same bucket. Um, Cities and Flight is in its own. It can have a well for all I care. It's buried. <laughs> yeah. It's in its uh, own coffin. <laughs> <laughs> the fireplace. Uh, fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> I think Star is my destination. This guy and I am Legend go in the same bucket. Yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah, I, I have I have them sort of similar. 
I think mm-hmm. I've am legend somewhere floating between the two buckets. It's falling out of one bucket, trying to crawl its way across the floor, <laughs> uh, but didn't didn't quite make it. I have to keep on putting it back in the other bucket. <laughs> back to your home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm I'm picturing a book cross. <laughs> I'm nearly there, guys. I'm nearly there. I made it. I can't imagine that. <laughs> I mean, this is its own sci-fi story all by itself. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we haven't had any other biological sci-fi. Maybe this one no. counts, but no other biology sci-fi. But mm, not yet, anyway. Cool. In in that case, uh, the next three books, once again, that we're going to be reading are "Lot of Light" by Roger Zelazny, "The Fifth Head of Cerberus" by Gene Wolfe. And Gateway by what? Frederick Bull over February, March, and April. Uh, if you'd like to join us, oh, sorry, we didn't do outros. <laughs> Susanna, would you like to start us off this time? <laughs> uh, well, you can find me at Page Chewing Forums or my channel, Den of the Weird, or X as Chronodendron. My books can be found pretty much anywhere. I have a new one coming out named Oblier. And it's available for pre-order on Amazon only for now. All right. Uh, I'm Jared. You can find me at the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel. And uh, you can also find me at Page Chewing Forums. And where I hang out a lot with Chris. <laughs> oh, that was smooth, nice. wasn't it? That wasn't that good? <laughs> no. uh, well, my name is Chris Mullen. I sometimes make YouTube videos, sometimes uh, make videos with the rest of this lovely crowd as well. And you can find me probably over in the page tuner for us on the occasions that I can not be lazy and post <laughs> comments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, Twitter, or X, threads, Instagram, everywhere as Livia J. Elliott. And I also hung out on the page chewing forum. Cool. And you can find me haunting the page chewing forum as well. Um, I, and <laughs> as I was starting to say earlier, if you'd like to join us for this reading group or any of the other four or five we've got going on, <laughs> consider checking out the page chewing <laughs> forum. Uh, we'll see everyone in about a month to talk about Lot of Light by Roger Zelazny. <laughs>